Good morning and welcome to a spectacular African dawn. My name is Brent Deere Smith. We have Andrew Francis on camera. We have Jamie and Brian out in the other vehicle. And we have Geraldine and Nicola in final control. And we're on the search for the largest of Africa's big cats. So apparently at 1 a.m., uh, a big thank you to Kevin Catfish, the Ravi and Star, who saw the three Inkahuma ladies on the damn wall, and apparently they headed north. So I'm just checking carefully for tracks. I'm hoping they haven't gone straight into this block. I'm hoping they have decided to meander down the road to make our tracking a little bit easier. So far, no luck with tracks. I'm thinking they might have crossed on that hard ground behind us straight through north into the block. We're going to check a little bit further down here. Jamie is checking the northern boundary, see if they've got that far. But an exciting sunrise far ahead of us. Very, very exciting. And Jamie's just calling me on the game drive, so let's see what she's got to say. Standing by. keep giving us surprises. Toby, thanks very much. Um, I'm going to go over to the access and see if they cut back. So, Jamie's got tracks on the northern boundary, but heading west back towards where they came from a few days ago. So, this morning, the Birmingham boys were making one huge ruckus in the east. They did sound, unfortunately, beyond our boundary. But they were calling their heads off this morning. Now, there were actually more than one, so Andrew, to emulate, you need to call as well. challenging all our viewers recently to do different noises. So here's another chance uh, for you guys. Pop your best lion roar on a video and check it out onto our Facebook page, Safari Live, or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Let us have a look what your best lion impression sounds and looks like. The wonderful thing about Having a video of you doing all these wonderful sounds is you can look as silly as we do when we do them. And don't forget, we welcome questions about what we're looking at, about what's happening in the bush around us, and the way to contact us is you can send us an email with questions at wildearth.tv or, as I said, pop the hashtag Safari Live on anything on Twitter and do try to get through as many of your questions as possible. And there was a nice bug on the screen. Andrew uh, used his magic breath to blow it away. But as I said, we do try to get through as many of your questions as possible. Um, if we don't answer your questions on the particular safari, please don't become despondent. Just keep sending them. Eventually, they will get to us. So we do try. But must remember, we get a lot of questions every drive, and we do try to answer as many as possible. So while we try to jump ahead of Jamie to try to guess where the tracks are going, uh, let's go back. Oh, let's actually not go back. Let's jump on with Jamie, who's hot on the heels of the Inkahuma Pride. And now, of course, it becomes a competition to see who can find the lions first. I feel as though I have an advantage because their tracks are heading right towards Sydney's dam. But good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our portion of the Sunrise Safari. My name is Jamie, and I have Brian on camera with me this morning. And we're going to be following up on those tracks. I got totally sidetracked. Ha ha, sidetracked. <laughs> uh, totally sidetracked by... I was on my way to the hyena den and then of course you sent through those updates on the fact that the lions had crossed the Juma Dam wall. I'm still on their tracks now. They're going straight towards either Gowrie Gate or Sydney's Dam. So let's keep our fingers crossed. We're coming up to the dam now and hopefully there's some lions there. Preferably on a kill so that they stick around. 
You never know. They were also looking very hungry last night. Not very hungry, but fairly hungry. They looked as though they were going to spend the evening hunting. And it was a, for a portion of the night at least. It was dark and cloudy and fairly windy. There's a very high possibility that they managed to catch something. It's one of those things I love about going out first thing in the morning is unfolding the mysteries of what happened last night. And you know that you're only getting the tiniest portion of the various stories, but it's still worth having a look anyway. Their tracks have gone off. They've cut north into Buffles Hook. Just while I was talking to you, but let's go check around Gowry Gate because there's no sign of them around Sydney's Dam. You never know, they might pop back onto the road at some point soon. Good morning, Impalas. Lovely bachelor herd. Doing their morning stretches. Absolutely stunning in this morning light. That bright red colour. I'm not going to linger too long. <laughs> Quick scratch. And of course, an impala, to continue with our tracking story, an impala would be on the menu for those lionesses, but it would be basically a snack. Even for three over 100 kilogram lionesses, so close to 200 pounds. An impala like that doesn't stretch terribly far, so it's possible, but unlikely. Those Nkuhuma ladies, the females that we're tracking, seem to have a speciality in hunting buffalo, even when it is just the three of them. We're still missing, uh, not necessarily, I don't know what happened last night if she rejoined, but there was one lioness missing from the group. We know that the one female, the one adult female, is mating with one of the Birmingham boys at Nkoro. And then we had two adult females plus a sub-adult sitting in a group yesterday afternoon on the Sunset Safari, all cuddled up together, approaching the afternoon in a very lazy manner. But that still leaves us missing one, if my calculations are correct. There should be four adult females and one sub-adult female. It looks as though they might have crossed into Buffles Hook. I haven't seen their tracks since we started our introduction. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get hold of Brent and just let him know that. Brent for Jamie. at least one set went off into Buffalo's Hook around just before Sydney's Dam. Um, it doesn't look as though they've come back out onto the road. Copy that, so I'll keep checking access. Copy that. And you're getting a sort of a behind the scenes tour of the Sabi Sands. We're coming across to Gowrie Gate where all of the guests enter. But it's very, very common for the ladies and gentlemen who man the gate to actually encounter or watch either lions or leopards or elephants walk past them. It's one of those magical things about working in the safari industry, no matter what aspect of the conservation industry you work in. You're always gonna have those wonderful encounters. No sign of them crossing here. I suspect Ooh, that's a hyena, never mind. There's some, there's some hyena tracks on this reserve. There are some females that their feet are actually almost as big as lion tracks. <laughs> oh, that's nice to know. And Brian Jurgensen has said that he's put his money on me finding them first. Brian, I have to be honest, I'm gonna put my money on them being in Buffles Hook, unfortunately, but it's not confirmed yet. I appreciate, though, your um, expression of your faith in me. So while we go back to the last, tra last tracks, just double check that they haven't popped out somewhere around here. Let's hop onto Brent's vehicle and find out if he's any closer than I am. Sorry. 
So it sounds like it might have possibly headed north, but here we've got some very distressed looking buffalo tracks running south. So hopefully it means that the lions were after them. Quite a few different sets of buffalo tracks around here, but unfortunately no lion tracks just yet. So the joy of actually following up on an animal with both vehicles is that we can cover twice the amount of ground and increase our chances of finding these big cats for you. So we are going to check through. If we do find no tracks up towards the sort of northwestern corner of Juma, uh, we're going to leave this area and see if we can find something else. But one must remember for every set of tracks that leave, the set of tracks that come in, we just got to find them. Absolutely spectacular African dawn this morning and definitely one of my favorite times to be out. It's quite nippy, so quite a, quite a welcome change to have a bit of cool weather. Hopefully it doesn't get too cool. I'm quite allergic to the cold. Oh, look at that. That's an African fish eagle. off to find some water to go catch some catfish. There's a nice start to the bird list for the morning. It's disappeared. It's disappeared. And is it? It's mine, it's mine, it's mine. And that's her imitation of lions as taught by me. And uh, for those of you who might be new, uh, my grandfather and father, when we were small children living in the bush, uh, taught us what a male lion says. So when he calls, <clears throat> he actually says, Whose land is it? Whose land is it? It's mine, it's mine. That is how we got taught as small children uh, what a lion says. Uh, morning, Lee. Just tracks of the Ink Umas look like they crossed north of Hook into Buffalo's Hook around Sydney's. Uh, other than that, no updates as of yet. In Kuma, in Gala. Morning, morning. Look at that. They're trying to blind me because oh, because they're scared we're going to find the lions and leopards before them. So they're trying to yeah. affect my vision. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Good morning again. Good morning. Hello, morning. Brian. Hello, Brent. Hello, Andrew. Hello, Andrew. Hello there. <laughs> North. I think uh, northbound okay. Sydney's. I haven't seen anything come out around Gowrie Gate. Um, okay. No. What's traffic though? Yes. What's your plan from here? My plan is to go to the Tunisi Kaya. Ah. Go. See, Jamie's giving up on the, the leopard and lion competition and just going to the hyena den where she knows there's yes. animals. Yes, that's, ex that's exactly how it's going to play out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we'll let Jamie continue on to the hyena den. We're going to go look for some leopard or lion. Either will suffice. Enjoy. Cheers, guys. Bye, Brian. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Bye, Bye Jamie. We winning, we winning. <laughs> there you go. As Andrew says, we are winning. But let's be honest, if you're on safari on a morning like this, everyone's winning. So 
very warm safari live welcome to Scott in Kingston, Wisconsin. Sorry, this is the game drive. Ah. But Scott says people in the in in the North Americas hike with bells quite often uh, to try let any animal ahead of them know you're looking at that. Now that is a wonderful and I, and Scott, I will get to your. Now that is a particularly large elephant bull track, Scott. I'm going to get back to your question in a second, but just I'm going to show you how big this elephant bull is. So I'm not so good at U.S. Uh, shoe sizes, but in the U.K. I'm a, a size 12 or 13, and uh, look at that. So. That's the, the back foot on top of the front foot. And this back foot is bigger than most elephants' front feet. So if I put my foot in it, it is literally two of my feet. And those are, so that's a size 24. And that's the front foot. So the back foot actually is even bigger. It's about two and a bit. I mean, sorry, the front foot's even bigger, the, the back foot's smaller. Obviously, the front foot in most animals is much bigger. Lions and leopards as well, it's got to carry that bulk of the head and the shoulders and all that muscle around there. Well, but Scott was asking about bells, and would we do that out here in Africa, or would the unwanted attention possibly cause danger? Well, I don't think it would cause danger, Scott, but quite often when we're hiking, particularly out here or walking, we're actually tracking animals on foot, whether it be lions or leopards or elephants or buffalo. So we actually want to find them, and we don't mind finding them on foot. So if anything, wearing a belt might possibly alert them to our presence. So they would slink off before we can find them. And... Uh, of course, very different. I mean, we, we are, are very well trained and been in the bush a really long time. So it's, it's a very different thing to go marching off in search of a lion or an elephant. But no, I, I've never heard of bells being used in South Africa. And most people who are not real bush people, when they go walking, they make too much noise to find an animal anywhere. Just double checking here. of the lions. That's the reason why the ears have got a bit quiet. There we go. So while we go in search of leopards and lions, let's go back to Jamie who's got the tallest animal in the African bush who actually shares a part of their Latin name, the leopard. Bless you, Andrew. And sitting with the Acunilopardus, or the giraffe, the tallest creature, just topping off the scale, slightly taller than Brent and Brian. It's been a while since we've seen a giraffe like this, so it's actually a really wonderful moment. I can't actually think when I last saw a giraffe. It's been at least a few weeks. You know, this is a stunning bull who is playing camera shy at the moment. And I will try and sneak closer to him. I just wanted to give you a nice view. You can see the patches of, or places where he's got some kind of skin disease. Look at that beautiful dark color. And this is a very large bull. I'm sure we've seen him before. Nice to see him again. Let's see if he'll let us.
on the long road south. Uh, that is our western boundary. And we're just double checking to see if there are not any leopard tracks coming back to visit us. So as I said, any possible, if there's a track leaving, there has to be a track coming in. Just going slowly, checking. There's quite a lot of big animal paths here. Just an update coming through on the Game Drive channel. So, last station, please go again. Sorry about this, but we communicate with all the other guides, and that gives us the best possible chance of finding animals. Finding animals is a team game, not a solo sport. Just checking down the road, it looks like there might be something there. Could just be a bush. And a bush it is. like a bit of miscommunication rather than communication there. So I'm not sure what's going on. I'm just going to keep listening for a bit, but I'm back with you. You have my undivided attention. Please do send us questions as we go down the very corrugated western boundary. This is Andrew's least favorite road because of the bump to bump. Andrew, Brian is wondering, did you ever get that kunduan? For those of you wondering what a kunduan is, it's a Zulu word for a rat. So a peba is a mouse, nice small little cute thing. A good one is a great grey hulking beast. Looks like a baby elephant that likes to run over Andrew while he's sleeping. Andrew, did you ever get it? It was too quick for me, the little bugger. <laughs> and I hear, unfortunately, a James Richard says he's only going to do his lion call if I do mine. I think I've done mine twice already. I think that's getting a little bit cheeky there. Uh, I think we've already done it twice. Right. Now it's all, the ball is in your court, so to speak. Ah, sorry, James, I, I, miss, I misheard that. He would like to see the impression of Andrew sees the rat. Um, well, I think if I had to do an impression of Andrew sees the rat, it'd be a little bit undignified, running around screaming like a little girl. And uh, I personally do not scream and run from rats, so I'm going to take the high ground on this one. But we can make Andrew do it a little bit later. Uh, we'll get Andrew to run around like a headless chicken in front of the vehicle, and I'll go on to camera. But before we do that, we're going to utilize this cool early morning to try to find you guys some cats. And let's jump back with Jamie at the Giraffe. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. It seems as though the mic failed briefly, but it's okay. We're back up and running. Luckily, our giraffe is being incredibly obliging where he places his head. He essentially disappears behind the various knob thorns that he's hidden behind. There you can get a rough idea of that magnificent color of his. 
and the incredible size and strength of these animals, which we often underestimate. When, when we look at them, we forget that there's a good couple of hundred of pounds and kilograms there. Absolutely glorious in this incredible morning Summer night. On it's C, since he is being not, he has been not very obliging. I wonder if he's going to let me sneak closer. Because we're only getting glimpses of his face from behind the trees. Look, there's an eye. You can see, just a, an interesting aside, yes, good boy. Yes, stretch for those top leaves. <laughs> You can see all of those hooked thorns as he munches away. And you can see why it's so important for them to have those long eyelashes to protect their eyes. Doesn't bother him at all. Completely adapted to ignore the defense systems of the plant life out here. Munching away with those very nimble lips. And you can even Beautifully, you see the bald patch on the top of the ossicones, or the horns. And it's wonderful to have new viewers, as always, and we seem to get new viewers every single drive that we do. But as our giraffe is being so shy, Trevor Lane was wondering if the noise of our jeeps keep the animals nervous and hiding themselves, or not showing themselves at least. And the answer is it certainly depends on the animal. Trevor, if you stick around with us, and I sincerely hope that you'll do, you'll see how relaxed some of the creatures like the lions, the leopards, the hyenas can be. There's a hyena. <laughs> Wandering through a very thick block. Sorry, got, I don't know if it's going to, it's just walked past, it's one of the sub-adults. I promise you there was a hyena there, I'm not making it up, there we go. Here you go, Trevor, you can get a sort of a rough idea. Hopefully, this little sub-adult decides to come wandering through. Come on, little one. Come say hello. Nope. Off it goes. Cheers. We'll catch up with you later at the hyena den. They love this block. There's a couple of water pans around here that they love to go and lie in, particularly in the heat of the day. And something similar to the, what we were watching the three hyenas do last night, lying in the Juma Dam. Extraordinary sighting that we had yesterday evening with the hyena calling right next to the car. But yes, to Trevor, just to let you know, and I'm gonna try and sneak up on this giraffe, it depends on the animal and it depends entirely on your approach to how they react to your vehicle. So if you drive straight at them, and it's more what you do, all of the animals in the Sabi Sands have had vehicles driving around them since they were born. Their parents have had vehicles driving around them since they were born. It's one of the wonderful things about working out here is the fact that they are very familiar with vehicles coming through. But that being said, as with anything, we are driving in their home. And so it's very important for us to have respect for them. And just reading his body language, I think that if I try and get you a different view, he's actually gonna move away. So it depends on the animal, and it very much is up to the guide to read the way in which they are responding and to try and get a rough idea as to how they're going to react to you. It's not so much the noise necessarily of the vehicle as it is the motion of the vehicle. It's a pleasure, Trevor. I'm glad we could answer your question. And if you have a look for Trevor and any other new viewers who are unfamiliar with giraffe, I started talking about the bald ossicones. When I talk about ossicones, I mean the horns on the top of the giraffe's head. On males, they're much thicker, much more solid, and rubbed bald from a process that's known as necking, which is where they swing their necks around and knock each other on the sides or the legs or the neck with their heads. Uh, funnily enough, that's one of the reasons, in fact, it's one of the, it's the predominant explanation these days as to why giraffe have evolved to have such long necks. It's one of those fascinating changes in the way that we perceive things. Up until a couple of years ago, it was always thought that that giraffe's long neck was to reach the best leaves and to take it away from the competition of the smaller antelope. 
And the same theory was applied to the dinosaurs with long necks. Now scientists and evolutionary biologists are completely rethinking that theory and they see it more as a reproductive advantage. So similar to the long horns of say an impala or the spiraling horns of a kudu, the giraffe's long neck is an adaptation for fighting. Very interesting thought. The females, that's borne out by the fact that the females' ossicones are tufted and much, much smaller. And there's a clear biological difference and you often see giraffe feeding like this one is now. First of all, behind the trees, <laughs> hiding away from us, but also just with its neck completely lowered. Very common. In fact, I would say more common to see them feeding in this manner than to see them feeding with their necks stretched right up, trying to get the best leaves possible. Now this position that he's in, fascinating me enough, although he is hidden from us, this position that he's in actually requires more work for him than his natural upright head position. And that's because all along the back of his neck is a huge tendon, a very, very powerful elastic tendon that holds the head up without the giraffe having to contract any muscles. And in fact, he has to contract his muscles to pull against that tension of the tendon to put his neck down. And you'll notice they don't do it for extended periods of time, particularly lowered below their chest height. There's enormous heart, perfectly adapted for being able to pump blood all the way up to that head. But it does come with its own disadvantages and systems of blood flow to help keep the blood in the brain when it's in that upright position. You can imagine the pressure that that heart has to produce in order to, order to push blood all the way up the neck. And Kaylee, who is one of our six-year-old viewers, and Kaylee, I'm sorry I can't show you clearly, but you want to know what the round spot on our giraffe's neck is. If he obliges us by coming out into the open, which she doesn't seem to want to. Kaylee, giraffe get lots of different kinds of skin diseases. Oh, there he goes, that is there. Difficult to see in the sun, but they do get a wide range of skin disease from a virus, and they sometimes get growths or polyps, and then to something similar to mange or some kind of fungal infection. And for some reason, giraffe in particular, I've noticed, giraffe and buffalo seem particularly predisposed. In other words, they get skin diseases more often than other animals. And it's just a little itchy raw patch, Katie. Something where the skin's not growing, or the fur's not growing back, but nothing too dangerous for him, and it, it won't bother him too much. Just something that is naturally occurring and he can't get any cream for his... It's essentially like eczema, Kaylee. And in this beautiful morning light, we've got a wonderfully dark-colored giraffe. And Jen Coyle was wondering, does that determine the age, or at least does a giraffe go darker with age? And yes, Jen, to an extent, especially with the males, males definitely darken more than female, females with age. That being said, there's also a genetic factor involved. So I've seen some very old giraffe that are very pale in color, and I've seen some fairly young giraffe that are dark in color like their mothers. So it is, it's a combination of genetic factors and genetic variations in coloring, and the fact that they then darken, and particularly with the males, they get to an age at which their testosterone, testosterone levels spike. They start smelling. What you got there, Brian? Is that a hyena? Hello. Well spotted, Brian. Yeah, what you got there, Andrew? Wandering through. Probably on its way to the hyena den, which was my plan before I got distracted by the giraffe. <laughs> the giraffe totally unperturbed by the presence of a hyena. But yes, they do darken, the bulls do darken, and they start to secrete a substance that smells very bad, in my opinion. I'm just gonna try and reposition now that he's relaxed to us. He's got used to us being around. And 
Barbara. Barbara is a regular viewer and has started to get familiar with our various giraffe. And of course, they come and go as they want to. They've got four million hectares of untapped wilderness or unfenced wilderness. Hello, boy. You're very, very camera shy. It's okay. It's okay. Thank you, boy, for sticking around with us. Barbara wanted to know, is this the same male that we've tracked for a while or followed the progress of as he attempted to seduce a female with quite a young calf and he was with her for a long time, a couple of weeks at least. Barbara, I don't think it's the same male. I think this one is slightly larger and slightly darker. And that male that was following the female had sort of star-shaped spots. It's amazing the amount of variation. This hasn't really helped us at all, has it, Brian? <laughs> He's still <laughs> hidden. He's still completely hidden. Hey, boy. Just let my engine run for a bit. subtle. There we go. Slightly different view of our giraffe. Luckily he's nice and calm to our present presence. Hello boy. Oh don't go away. Something's attracted his attention there. <laughs> I love watching the way that they duck and dive. So Eric who is watching in Virginia Beach. Hi Eric. Good morning. You wanted to know, apart from the sort of the long neck, the long eyelashes, standard adaptations that we often chat about, you're wondering if there are any less obvious adaptations. And I'm going to do some of the more obvious ones as well, just for new viewers. So a giraffe's tongue is one of their main interesting features. <laughs> He's so camera shy, this giraffe. Doesn't want to play nicely. Let's try and sneak forward. making life difficult for poor Brian. He's filming more leaves than giraffe. He can't he keep hiding. There we go, sort of, a little bit better. But Eric, that tongue, and for new viewers, the tongue is about, can reach up to 50 centimeters long. To so put that into inches, it's probably about 20 inches. And that's adapted to wrapping around the leaves and getting to the best parts of the plant and being able to nimbly wrap around and dodge the various thorns that might be around. That being said, wrapping your tongue around a, here we go, hello gorgeous, wrapping your tongue around a thorn branch is something that they have to do with fairly, or on a fairly regular basis, which means that their tongue is black in color. And the reason it's black is because it's impregnated with melanin, the dark pigment that causes freckles in people is actually a fairly tough pigment. That's why we get freckles. Well, certainly with my sort of long way back Irish and Scottish heritage, it's certainly why I get freckles, because it's exposure to the sun and your body's attempt at protecting you. The melanin actually toughens the tongue and allows it to wrap around the thorny branches. So yes, the eyelashes, the position of the nostrils and their ability to close up so that they don't get spiked in the sensitive inner membranes of the nose ears positioned in the way that they are just like all the other antelope species or any of the bovids with independent movement and he's gone again <laughs> this giraffe i don't think wants to be on camera and i don't think we're going to be able to reposition to see him some more but we'll just finish up the discussion about adaptations the valve systems within the neck in order to allow for blood flow to be pumped up and then obviously as soon as that heart relaxes those valves have got to be incredibly strong to stop the blood from flowing back down against the flow of the artery. In the huge, huge 20 kilogram heart, if not larger in certain specimens, that's about, what's that, about 40 pounds, 40, 45 pounds. Same number of vertebra as we have, so seven vertebra in the neck. But I mean, when we talk about a vertebra, it's that long. You know, that's just one vertebra in a giraffe's neck. So that's one of their adaptations carry most of the weight in the front of their body, huge lungs and huge heart, as I said, to all cope with the blood flow up into the brain. And then the tendon in the neck as an energy efficient way of holding up, 
you can just imagine now a giraffe skull having picked up just a skull before that we found that giraffe skull that i found once was probably in the region of about 12 kilograms if not more definitely weighed at least a bag of flour probably a little bit larger now that was just the skull imagine with all of the flesh the muscle plus the muscle of the neck you get a rough idea of just how heavy that weight must be pulling downwards which is why they've adapted to have that tendon running down the spine and down the back of the neck and attached so that it essentially holds the neck upright and it's fascinating to watch i have found a giraffe before that had died of natural causes and i went forward and i pulled the head down so downwards as if it was bending its neck forwards and then released it and it shoots backwards. That aspect of their anatomy absolutely fascinates me. The rest of their adaptations, of course, are all pretty similar to the rest of the bovids or the antelopes, the four chambers or the four stomachs of a ruminant, allowing it to make the most of the nutrition that it happens to get. It allows it to be a little bit more selective about the food that it eats. What else is there in terms of adaptation? Mm. I suppose one of the interesting ones is the way in which the babies are born and the shape that they are. So the slightly shorter neck, they look disproportionate. Their legs look longer in proportion to their neck than adults do. And that's a way of them being born with the ability to keep up with the adults when they move. And giraffe are deceptively fast. You, they've got this very, they've only got two strides and there's only one other animal that walks like a giraffe and that is a camel. So it's completely unique in the mammal, almost unique in the mammal world, and the akapi, sorry. I think the akapi walks in the same way as well. And they walk with the two, they, they slant. So the two left feet, the front left foot, the front right, no, the front left foot, the back left foot. Oh my word, I'm getting my lefts and my rights confused. Those move simultaneously, and then the right side moves simultaneously. It's completely unique, and what that means is that giraffe can't trot. They can walk, which is fairly energy efficient, and they can cover huge distances, or they can run in a sort of sloping canter. And it's deceptively quick because it looks so gentle and smooth, but it's actually a very rapid movement. And I think we better speed up so I can go and visit the hyena den before it gets too hot. And to finish off with our adaptations in terms of basically being able for all animals, essentially, but especially for giraffe and elephant, Kim was wondering, do they have special sort of strengthening within their throat or protective measures for when they eat thorns? It's more prominent in elephants. Elephants are less selective in the way that they eat. They grab full-on branches of thorns. I've seen them stick entire sickle bush branches in their mouths with spines about this thick. Giraffe are a little bit more delicate in the way that they feed. They can afford to be because they're ruminants. They've got those four stomachs. So they need less food for their body size than something like an elephant that is only has one stomach and cannot afford to be as selective. An elephant just needs to constantly and I, I suppose the best way to put it is it constantly needs to be shoveling food into its mouth because its digestive system is very inefficient in comparison. And there's different advantages to both systems. But for giraffe, they can afford to be a little bit more selective and they can actually wrap their tongues around the branches and be collects less in the way of thorns. But yes, they will eat thorns inevitably. And yes, their throats, like their tongues, are strengthened with melanin as well to prevent any kind of slicing of that very delicate, what, what in us is a very delicate membrane down the esophagus. And while I race across with fingers crossed to see if we can have any action at the hyena den, let's have a look and see if Brent ha or what Brent's been up to. So, in your absence, Andrew and I have traversed the whole western boundary, the whole now southern boundary, and uh, we've parted the eastern boundary. I've just got a report from. Uh, Arathusa, 
They're just beyond this rise, just outside our traverse zone. And they'll fall lioness from the Styx Pride. Between us and them, there's some water back. Silhouetted against the morning light. <laughs> That female waterback, very distinct shape. Lion, lions, right here. Wait. In front of the waterback. Well, obviously those lions have moved. Now, is this in Kahumas or all the sticks? <laughs> Whoa. Oh. And suddenly, as my eyes adjusted to the light, I noticed something move in front of the waterback, and it was lions. Isn't that amazing? Look at that, lions and waterbuck. You can see the waterbuck taking very little notice of the lions. Now, I'm guessing this is the Styx Pride. But look at that pronking coming through on the left. Uh, I stop now. I've seen waterbuck do that often when faced with predators. This way, girls, this way. The Shambria of Ngala Cheetah Cut Line junction with Gauri Main. Let me just move, I'm blocking the whole road. Well, those lines have moved from where I heard they were. They've obviously come further towards us here. I'm just going to pop us in the spot. And look at that, isn't that beautiful? With the lines and the water back together there in that beautiful morning light. I think that definitely is worth a photograph. So if you hear a clickety click, don't worry, it's not the, the vehicle braking, it is just my camera. And I hope you guys are getting some fantastic screenshots as well. Isn't that, isn't that funny how the world works? Uh, notice the waterback silhouetted against the skyline, and then suddenly as my eyes adjusted, there's a lioness. Now, unfortunately, they are just beyond our traverse here, so I'm not sure, and I can't be sure whether this is in Kuma or the sticks, but I'm pretty certain it's possibly the sticks from where they were seen earlier this morning. to Safari Live with very sleepy kitties and waterbuck disappearing over the horizon. So Lady Luger is wondering, are they not going to chase the waterbuck? So quite often if lions have been spotted, they immediately give up the chase. They are ambush predators. The only animal they really tend to sort of harass once they've been spotted is buffalo. But with most of the antelope species, they are far too fleet of foot and will keep enough distance between themselves and the lions to avoid being caught. Well, that's the one thing about tracking. It's probably 20% skill. 80% luck if you know, don't have tracks. You've just got to drive the areas that you're confident the animals might be. And sometimes they are right there. Now that's quite interesting. Let me have a, get my binoculars out there. Now, the teeth look quite large. I'm just going to have a quick look. I haven't heard of any of the sticks having cubs, and it's quite difficult in this light. Uh, we'll find out from the other guides a little bit later whether any of the sticks have been recorded having cubs. It's a quite a nice full belly by the looks of things. Is another reason why they wouldn't be out and after those waterbuck. They've obviously had a midnight snack last night.
Um, James Taylor says, those water back are being pretty cheeky right now. But it's not uncommon with animals once they've spotted lions or leopard, especially if they feel they're no threat like these ones are, that they will just hang around, quite often look at them, snort. The waterback have departed. Can you still see any, Andrew? I think they've gone over the horizon. Well, we need to thank those waterback, because if I hadn't stopped because I thought the waterback silhouette was very pretty, I might not have spotted the lions because I was looking straight into the sun. Sabrina in North Carolina is wondering, do I enjoy tracking a lion or leopard more? Sabrina, I must say, probably I enjoy tracking them equally. They both give a different set of challenges. Leopard is definitely a far more technical animal to track because there's generally only one of them and their paws are much, much smaller than a lion's. So they are more difficult to track. And that is a whole challenge in itself but there is something incredibly special about being on foot with the dominant feline predator of Africa. I'd say I can't choose between the two. I love tracking both. Calgary is wondering where is the Styx's territory uh, and it's pretty much that's quite this area from the south of us here they do come into Juma but very very seldom very deep into Juma and we're right on our sort of south and eastern corner but generally from here south almost all the way to the Sand River so they have quite a big big territory you must remember with quite a lot of lion prides there is a little bit of overlap so there is overlap between the Styx and the Incahumas but the sticks seem to be faring a bit better than the Nkuhumas since the Birmingham takeover, and that can change. But the sticks pride I used to see eight, nine years ago, even longer than that, uh, when I used to work south of here. And they were incredibly large pride back then. There were sort of 14 individuals. But they have, they had, they have split since then, and they've had ups and downs with different male takeovers. So I'm not sure how many sticks. Uh, the most sticks I've ever seen together is four. And I can see three here. Let me just double check. They did say there were four, so there is quite possibly a fourth one either lying on the other side of the road or just over the rise that we can't see. How many you got, Andrew? Three. I've got three. All of them look to be large adults, so that's why I think it's safe to say they're not the Incahumas. And the fact that this, the sticks last night in the sunset safari were a couple of hundred meters from here. And we were with the Incahumas, uh, probably four kilometers. So quite a big distance. Uh, not to say a lion can't walk four kilometers in the night. A, a male lion who's on a serious territorial mission can have been recorded doing up to 25 kilometers in the night. And quite a funny story about that is my dad has always been a very much a bush person. My mom, not so much when she started. My mom was a professional tennis player living in Boston. And she met a long-haired uh, Zambian-born boy who knew how to ride horses. That's another long story. But on their honeymoon, uh, they did some very fancy places. But my dad took her camping in northern Botswana. And in those days, there was very little in northern Botswana. There were hardly any lodges. So a tiny little a-frame two-man tent and they went to a place called my pan which has got incredible lion densities and their first night out in the bush away from the hotels made dinner and got into bed and in the distance as we did earlier the li male lion starts calling mm. 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 and i can even imagine it kevin kevin how far is that line Oh, I don't know, four or five kilometers. My mother lies down again. Two minutes later. Kevin, Kevin, 
How far does a lion walk in a night? Oh, he can walk up to 20 k's. Whoop, zip out the tent into the car, and she slept there for the first two days of camping on honeymoon. And amazing enough now, and my mother goes out on game drive by herself looking for lions, uh, and it's been a, sorry, well, that was probably, oh, 30 odd, 34, 35 odd years ago. You know, heads are up a little bit. Oh. Yay, come this way. That's a good girl. Come join us. I haven't seen the sticks on Juma for such a long time. They are currently on Torchwood. But if she keeps heading in that direction, she might come on to our eastern boundary. I feel, oh, I'm afraid she's just heading for the shade, possibly. Sorry, guys, I just got to be on the game drive second for it. While I deal with the game drive, let's jump on with Jamie, who's with the other apex predator here in the Sabi Sands. Really? The other apex predator, and if I'm completely honest, one of my favorite predators, if not my absolute favorite. And I know I'm not alone in that. We've got a couple of regular viewers who are spotted hyena crazy, just like I am. It's been a while since I've been at the den, so I'm actually very excited to be here and to see just how much they've grown in the space of probably a week since I was last here. Awesome. Look how big these little cubs are getting. Wondering to explore whichever individuals just arrived. Who's that little one? There's a hyena just out of where you can see it's hiding behind the tree. And that's where that sub adult is going to investigate. And now that it's moved off, I can actually reposition to give you a nice view of the den. And you are in for a treat for new viewers. I promise you there is not much cuter out there than the baby hyenas that we've been watching at this den. Getting big now. November's looking enormous and very spotty. The hyena cubs, when they're born, are pretty much brown or black in color. Let's see if we can get you a nice view. Good morning. You full of mischief. And there you go, you can get an idea of just how little, uh, to carry on with the question from earlier, just how little the animals are affected by our presence in these kind of situations. We are so privileged to be able to watch, for example, Pretty, the adult female that's lying here with her cub. The cub is called November because it first made an appearance on television, probably one of the most famous hyenas in the whole world, that little cub. November, having breakfast. And as an only cub, or the sole surviving cub at least, plenty of access to high nutrient content milk. I'm so glad that they haven't moved. I was a little bit concerned they might have. It's been so long since I've come to visit this den site. You get to really enjoy special moments like this. You're getting so big, November, you don't fit comfortably around mom's tummy like you used to. So Maggie, who's watching in Vancouver, you were wondering whether or not they've moved. And clearly the answer is no, thank goodness. It always takes us a little bit of time, unless we get very lucky, to relocate them once they do move. The nice thing is, is that they regularly rotate through known den sites. Now for new viewers, the reason that they move from den to den is because eventually what happens, particularly with the younger cubs, is they will both urinate and defecate and then live in the holes in which they are born. And it starts to build up a parasite or quite a high parasite content. The den starts to get very smelly. And obviously that's not entirely hygienic and also can attract the attention, negative attentions of, for example, something like a lion pride 
although I'm fairly certain that the lions know exactly where the hyena dens actually are. But yes, they then move and the mothers will all shift their cubs either by carrying them or if they're sort of November's age, they'll be able to trot along beside mom. And the most fascinating social structure of, I think personally, one of the most fascinating social structures of any mammal. The only truly matriarchal system. Females are bigger, stronger, full of testosterone. Testosterogen, why do I keep doing that? Testosterogen. <laughs> Androgen and testosterone. Testosterogen is not a word. So the high content of male hormones and a fascinating structure of hierarchy within the clan itself, all dominated by one top female and her offspring. And I'm fairly certain that the individuals that we're looking at are going to be high ranking within this hyena clan. Pretty seems to be fairly well established within the clan itself. You can see why she's called pretty. Although it's always useful just to give them names so that we're able to keep track of their movements. But she is one of the most attractive hyenas. And for all of you who are excited to pay another visit to the hyena den, it's an absolute pleasure. I cannot believe that Brent managed to win the lion competition this morning by pure luck. Pure luck, and I don't think it counts, <laughs> because if you're looking at a water buck for two minutes before you spot them and you haven't tracked them, it definitely doesn't count. <laughs> but speaking of Brent and the lions, let's find out what those lions are up to. There, there we go. It looks like all oh, the lions are heading towards that lovely little bit of shade to have a snooze. They're still one out in the sun. I was hoping they were going to move closer towards us, but they might do that or save that for the sunset safari. And uh, Jamie's saying, I found the lions due to luck, uh, not due to skill. Well, of course, it pays to be lucky. What can I say? There we go. She's doing a bit of cleaning. Anyway, I think there's quite a lot of skill in being lucky. What do you think, Andrew? Definitely. Yes. There's that saying, you make your own luck. And if that's the case, quite good of it, I think, especially when it comes to the kitty cats. There we go. I think mean, she's going to pop up and walk across to the other two in the shade quite shortly. So we're going to stay till she does that. And then if they are flat cat in the shade, we're going to move on to see if we can find the other big cat that's here. And hopefully some Ellie's as well. But I think we'll stay with these lines a little bit longer. I'm pretty certain she's going to get up and move to the shade. It, it does feel like someone's turned up the thermostat in the last 10 minutes or so. So where it was nice and cool lying out there, probably a little bit chilly so that we're catching some morning rays. Those morning rays have now become pulsating heat and I think those lions are going to lie up in the shade here for the majority of the day. It'll be very interesting to see where they go from here. The closest water is almost directly behind them. They may have come from there already. I wonder where the fourth lion is. is. So a very big safari live welcome to Shell, who's a regular, and her mom who's watching, who's not a regular. And Shell's mom is quite shocked. She says, I thought these lions were wild. Why are the vehicles so close? Well, Shell, they are definitely wild lions. And the reason we can get so close in vehicles is that these lions have grown up with safari vehicles all around them. So they are habituated to the presence of vehicles. Uh, that by no means detracts from the fact that these are wild animals and 
are potentially incredibly dangerous. But if you drive carefully and considerately and don't push them, uh, you are able to get close and have some spectacular sightings. And when we move from here, I will give a nice long explanation on how you habituate the big cats to the presence of vehicles. There's quite a few different ways. And some are sort of more traditional or old school and others quite new. James, Kim and Dory have been snapping away at some screenshots and I think that lioness I said looked like her mammary glands were enlarged but looks like she might be pregnant. As I say, I'm not going to gander a guess uh, when I'm this far away from them. I'd like to have a look at her a bit closer before I, before I guess but it did look even from this distance like those mammaries were engorged. is wondering, is the Styx pride, the pride with the tailless female? It's not, uh, Helen, that is the Tsalala pride. The Tsalala pride, T-S-L-A-L-A. -L -A. And that is named after an area in Londolozi to the south of us called Tsalala Pan. And Tsalala is the Shungan word for a gardenia tree. Now, the Styx Pride, how they got the name, there's quite a lot of different stories. They were named on Mala Mala uh, a long time ago. It's be, this pride's been around in various forms for probably the last 15 years or so, maybe even a bit longer. And as far as I can work out, there's some reference to the River Styx um, from mythology is where their name comes from. I think it's been lost, uh, the original meaning of why they are called the Styx Pride, because it's S-T-Y-X. So, uh, if I remember correctly, there is some reference to the River Styx. Well, she must have been colder than the other lionesses, because she seems to be really enjoying this African sun. We've got a new viewer in the Big Apple. And look at that. On cue for Linda in New York, the lioness is going to walk for us. So, Linda, a new viewer from New York. A big welcome. Linda says, this is awesome. It is, Linda, and it's awesome to have you on the back of the vehicle. And don't forget, you can join us twice a day, every day, for live African safaris. And here we go. Off to the rest of the pride, and a little bit of face nuzzling, and I think a flop will happen quite shortly. Oh, or maybe she's going to move, nope, and flop behind the bush. So, isn't that wonderful? You never, literally never know what's around the corner here in the African bush, but we're gonna leave these lines lying up there. We will come back and check on them later in the safari, but in the meantime, let's go see what else we can find. And also, let's jump on the back with a Gemma and see what she's up to. Morning, Doves. While you were with Brent and those lionesses, I was just trying to figure something out, and it's something I will put to you as the viewers. So in safari terms, we very often refer to flat cats. And by the way, there was, there's what looks like. Definitely, madam, I'm not sure if the other adult is corky or not. 
hard to tell. Madam, of course, being the matriarch and Corky being the mother of the December twins. No sign of the newest set of cubs, though. And then, <laughs> did you see that puff of dirt as she blew out? Exhaled that sigh of exhaustion. But yes, in safari terms, we often talk about flat cats, describing, for example, the scenario of the Unkahumas yesterday afternoon, where they barely move. And then we've got, apparently, log dogs, which is a new one for me, but it's something that's been termed for when the wild dogs go flat, which is not very often, except in the heat of the day. But now we need one for hyenas as a description of their sleepy state. Uh, not much rhymes with hyena. Doesn't work quite as well as flat cats or log dogs. I'm proposing an alliterative approach. Hyenas on hiatus. I had a good chuckle at my, at my own wordplay there, although I think it's actually probably not as, as appealing as I thought it might be in my head. Hyenas on hiatus. But I'll put it to you guys if you can think of any other good description. <laughs> any good description of a flat hyena in the shortest possible terms in a way that sounds as um, informative as flat cats. <laughs> Jerry says we can improve on that. She's not fond of my hyenas on hiatus. Oh, there we go. I'll have to put it to you guys. I'm out of options. I'm out of thoughts. We'll have to figure out a term for flat hyenas. One of the fascinating aspects and one of the reasons why hyenas are so interesting is their, their arrangement in the way that the females are structured. And of course, they have pseudo-penises, which is an extended clitoris, a urethra fused with a vaginal tract. So they urinate and give birth and mate through the same entrance. Very, very strange, very interesting structure, and one that is not really as well adapted to the natural processes of a female as it is in other mammals. They even have false testicles, which you can kind of see here on pretty, little bit extended. But Katrina has read that 60% of spotted hyena cubs die of suffocation when they are born to first time mothers. And Katrina, that's absolutely correct. I didn't know the exact percentage, so thank you for providing us with that. I did know it was a very high percentage. And actually, what can often happen is the female giving birth can die as well. And the reason behind that is it is such a restricted birthing canal. Hello. You with the full belly. Look as though you've eaten a football. Oh, my goodness. That hyena has been in a scrap. Injuries all across the bottom of its neck and across its backside. Now that could have come from several different options. It could have been from a fight with other hyenas. And I would guess that that hyena isn't particularly high ranking within this particular clan setup. It's wandered off. It's been separate the entire time, thought about approaching the rest of the clan and then moved off. Could also have happened during a hunt. And of course, spotted hyenas, despite their very undeserved reputation of being filthy scavengers are, as Brent said, apex predators and more than capable of hunting their own food, which they do very regularly. It just depends on the area that you're in and the lion density as to the percentage that hyenas either hunt or scavenge. So it could have been an injury from that. The other option is an encounter with something like a pack of wild dogs. So yes, that, the other option is an escape from one of the other predators. But Brian, just to finish off, because you asked whether or not hyenas are scavengers or predators, hunters, they're actually, when they put their minds to it, they are probably more efficient hunters than something like a lion. Their success rate in terms of kills attempted versus kills actually achieved is higher. For lions, it's somewhere in the region of between 10 to 20%, depending on the dynamics of the lion pride itself. Whereas with hyenas, the, when they set their minds to it, their success rate is probably 
between 60 to 80 percent of kills initiated, therefore uh, resulting in successful kills. And the reason behind that is they're not ambush or stealth predators like lions or leopards, and they don't overheat in the same way. They've got incredible stamina. And it's one of those evolutionary things that probably came into existence due to their competition with lions. And depending on the lion density versus the kind of prey distribution of an area, that will determine the percentage that a hyena clan will hunt versus scavenge. Now, my guess with this hyena clan is that they mostly scavenge. However, in the time during which the lions were not on Juma, but the surrounding properties, and quite often away from this clan's, what I think of as, the, as this clan's boundaries, they probably were hunting far more than we realized. They're adapted for nocturnal activities. So again, we might not necessarily have seen all of their successful kills, but they're more than capable of taking down zebra, wildebeest, or even a kudu would be on the menu for hyenas. And just to finish off with Katrina's question as well, that evolutionary line that has led to that very strange arrangement in terms of the female's reproductive organs is also something that has been considered to be an adaptation because they were in competition with a social predator like a lion. The bigger the female, the better access to food and therefore the more milk that they produce. And you see it even within the clan itself. The higher ranking females get better access to food and therefore can lactate for longer and their cubs can go on to suckle for longer. And hyenas will feed their youngsters. It's a very prolonged period of time that they feed and care for their babies in this way. Up to a year and a half, when you think of lions and leopards that have a much, much shorter time period, at least half of that, before their youngsters start to supplement feed with meat. And hyena cubs will do that as well. And what's interesting is that there was always this idea that spotted hyenas will never bring food back to the den. And what's interesting is that studies have shown that it's more, the high ranking females are more likely to take, be able to take the food away from the rest of the feeding clan and to drag it for kilometers back to their den site to supplement feed their cubs. And that in turn gives them a much higher success rate in terms of cub survival because the cubs don't have to leave the safety of the den and the females have better access to food in order to provide milk. Whereas with lower ranking females, they can't necessarily sustain an extended lactating period. And so they have to start taking their cubs to kills earlier and therefore exposing them to the dangers of the outside world. It's one of the other reasons why, of course, the dens start to smell quite bad after a while. Well, we definitely saw a drag mark from something. There's no evidence of it now. But these hyenas at some point dragged a carcass or some part of a carcass over at least two kilometers. Saw the drag marks from Gauri Cutline. They're extraordinary creatures. The strength and the stamina compared to lions is phenomenal. Just have a look at those incredible feet. You can see why the two lobes at the back show through more clearly. You'll be able to see it on the dogs as well, but also look at the way that the toes fit together like a puzzle piece almost. The way that their sides are squashed together. Now with leopards and with lion tracks, those, their toes always fall separately. There's always a little bit of space between each toe. Whereas with hyenas, I always think that it's, it looks as though they are pieces of a puzzle joined together. And you can see how this one's claws have been completely worn down. Constant walking up and down. Much smaller than their front feet. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> I really thank you for all of your suggestions as to our description of flat hyenas. And from Jen and Lou and many, many others, you have suggested horizontal hyenas. I cannot believe I didn't think of that. That's quite shameful. <laughs> How did my brain 
<laughs> miss out on that option. And Lady Lurga and Janet have suggested siesta hyenas. Siesta hyena also works very well, although I think I'm swaying towards the horizontal hyenas. I cannot believe I didn't think of the obvious one there. This is why we have, or one of the reasons why we have such wonderful viewers, to provide us with good ideas when our brains fail us. Oh my word, the options are streaming in. Flopped spots. <laughs> what were the other ones again? I'm getting so many of your suggestions. I... Whoop is at rest, I quite enjoy as well. Hovering hyenas. That just, yeah, now I can, all I can see is hyenas hovering off the ground. <laughs> oh, genius, guys. Thank you very much. There's some brilliant suggestions within there. I think horizontal hyenas turns out to be the easiest one to remember, but I'm impressed by all of your suggestions. I'm struggling to choose which one I think is the better one. And my goodness me, Sandblaster, you've, I think, won the day there with your suggestions with Hyena Pantina when they are dirty, Hyena Marina when they are in the water, Hyena Ballerina when they are playful, Hyena Cantina for when they are eating, and Hyena Arena when they are fighting. I'm pretty sure you just won the day with that. That was quite, that's very impressive. Sandblaster, you have my full respect and a round of applause for that combination. Above and beyond the call of duty or my desperate plea for some brain power. <laughs> very, very impressed. So our horizontal hyenas, our flopped spots, whatever else we want to nickname them, or hyena on hiatus, which is my sad little suggestion. They are completely at rest, but at least it's nice to know that they are still at this active den site. I'm very grateful. I was anticipating a long and prolonged search for when they disappear before finding them again. The last time I found a hyena den was a couple of months ago, and it was purely by luck. After they disappeared for a long time, we happened to pull into a elephant sighting and we were sitting just about to leave, it was with Liam, and a hyena just wandered onto screen and led us straight to the den. But we've got lots of different methods for refinding them if they do decide to disappear. I hope though, my personal hope is that they decide to go to a familiar den, one that we already know. Might make life a little bit easier. I'm so impressed with Sandblaster. I think it is time for us to leave our wonderful hyena clan. We've got other wonderful things to go off in search of. It's always a tricky balance finding the amount of time and personally I could spend quite happily all day sitting watching the dynamics of hyena dens but I don't think that they're going to be up to terribly much anymore. It's starting to get warmer again. The sun is high in the sky already, and I think they're going to spend the rest of their day in similar positions. So let's head out and go and see what we can find. That, of course, is provided Rusty will allow me to start. Hey, there we go, brilliant. Bye-bye, hyenas. Sleep well. 
Enjoy your day. <laughs> and as I said, the temperature's starting to rise already. And for our new viewer, Trevor Lane, you were wondering if it warms up fast here. And Trevor, by, depending on the weather, and it's been slightly cooler recently, much to everybody's release, relief, you, were, you are absolutely right. It warms up incredibly rapidly. So by, sometimes by 7 o'clock in the morning, and I think we, yeah, we are approaching 7 o'clock, the temperature will already start topping out at about 30 degrees centigrade, which is around the late 80s to early 90s in Fahrenheit. If I convert quickly in my head, I have to confess my Fahrenheit Celsius conversion is not always entirely up to scratch. But it can top, get really, really warm. I'm still in my jacket, but that's only because I haven't quite had the opportunity to take it off yet. And I think once I start driving into the sun, it's going to be off very shortly. And in midsummer, our sun, because of the rotation of the Earth, or the, the, the way in which it rotates, during our summers, it's slightly closer in position to the sun. So the sun is unbelievably strong on our summer days. One of those things that's important to remember when you're out on safari, that you've got to be careful of making sure you protect your skin very thoroughly. And we'll, you'll notice we always wear hats. We've always got sunscreen with us. It's just one of those things that is part and parcel of the safari experience. And while we head out for more wonderful safari experiences to add to yours, let's find out what Brent was up to while we were at the hyena den. So we're busy checking at the northern sectors of Juma Game Reserve for any sign of tracks. Could be tracks of wild dog, could be leopard, could be cheetah. Water hole, bone dry. Continue on, even though it's dry, quite a lot of the cats still use this route. It's one of their more common routes when they're marking territory. Now, it probably became quite common because there was a spot to stop for a drink. But even though there's no water there, they'll still continue to utilize their normal sort of paths. Yeah, 300, 400 meters. 
So if I spotted lines and I was in an area where they were not used to vehicles and they often ran away, I would stop here at about 300, 400 meters. And I'm pretty sure they're going to be able to see me from that sort of distance. And I would start talking quite loudly because of the distance, but also keeping my voice really, really calm. And probably for the first seven or eight or nine times, um, I would try to keep distance. Sometimes, depending, reading their body language, you can actually try closer. So for the first sort of 10 times, you keep distance. And, you, and eventually, they get used to you at that distance, and they, they don't run away, and they, they just relax. And then, after that, we would go a little bit closer. So the next time, for the next week or two, we would suddenly stop 50 meters closer, 50 meters closer. And a lot of people think, oh, you should be quiet. Blah, blah, blah. Not really. I, I believe you should actually talk, get them used to the sound of the voice and the sound of the vehicle. Look at that, flying straight at us. It was a levelance. Cuckoo, is it going to land? So you keep going close and you keep speaking. I mean, you can habituate them without speaking. Obviously, then you can never talk when you're in a sighting, which doesn't quite work when you try to explain to your guests what's going on. So keep talking. Uh, the other, other, one of the other things we used to do quite often is if we found them on a kill, we would drive a vehicle in, leave it about 100 meters from the kill, get off the vehicle and leave an old sort of transistor radio uh, with BBC One playing. So they get used to the sound of people's voice from a distance overnight. Uh, that is actually a very effective method with leopards, especially unrelaxed leopards. You, you just find that where killers, you park a vehicle 100 meters away and you leave the radio on all night and they'll come back to the meeting and they get used to the sound of the person's voice and used to the vehicle in the presence. Uh, the best way to habituate leopards. Lion are much easier to habituate than, than leopards. Um, is to find a female leopard who's got cubs. And with having dens and keeping them in quite regular spots, it makes them much easier to find. And secondly, the cubs become habituated much easier being younger. And the cubs actually eventually habituate the mother. And the most effective way is leaving that vehicle with the radio play. Most of all, it's, it's just time, a bit of patience, and, and, and knowing animal behavior, learning to read when they're uncomfortable, if they're uncomfortable, move back, start again. And it's, it, is, it is possibly one of the most rewarding things I've ever done in my life, is to habituate big cats to the presence of people. One of the funny ones is hyenas don't ever seem to need habituation uh, to the same degree. They habituate much faster far more versatile and adaptable. So this is not a road we drive too often. So I thought we would take a gander since there are no tracks anywhere else this morning. Definitely, and actually the biggest advantage of an electric vehicle is how quiet it is. You'll be able to hear alarm calls much more easily than over a, a petrol or diesel engine. And fortunately, electric vehicles, especially in sort of safari format, haven't got there just yet. I think they still need a little bit of development. There was a lodge that had an electric vehicle. Uh, I'm not going to say which lodge, but it, it actually blew up <laughs> while charging. So they haven't quite developed the, the right type of electric vehicle, but I definitely feel the future of safaris is definitely electric vehicle. Uh, just being able to travel with almost no noise would be absolutely splendid. One thing with
with an electric vehicle, I think you'd have to be far more careful approaching animals, specifically things like elephants. Because it's so quiet, you could give them a big surprise. They don't hear you coming. So it might be worth your while sort of talking a little bit louder when you're on an electric vehicle, just so you don't surprise those animals. that had an electric vehicle that blew up while charging nearly burnt down all the other vehicles as well. And I, since I've heard, I don't think they replaced that electric vehicle. I think they replaced it with another petrol vehicle. But definitely, in the future, uh, I definitely see electric vehicles as being 100% the best way to, to go on a safari from a vehicle. actually come across a really, really fascinating point. And quite often when you go on safari, you're told to wear greens and car keys or khakis, as you would say in the, in the North Americas. And Kristen's wondering, is there a reason for this and why? Well, the main reason I can find for wearing such things is to not offend the other people on safari. So most animals do see in black and white and don't react to the color. Now, strange enough, the two worst colors to wear on a safari are black and white. So with most animals seeing in some form of monotone gray, black and white are actually the two colors that stand out the most. White probably even more so than anything else. So there is no reason to actually wear dull green or brown clothes. It does just feel a little bit more proper though, and it is part of the sort of safari image and it does on foot it's it's a lot more important to wear clothes that bend in but on a vehicle it doesn't really matter to be honest you could wear bright pink the lions are still going to behave the same way now chatting about safaris a, there's actually a very common disease that is spread through especially first-time safari goers. And it's called khaki fever. And Andrew is cackling already. So I wonder if anyone out there knows what khaki fever is. A very specific disease that besets particularly uh, first-time safari goers. And if anyone out there knows what khaki fever is, pop me a message or an email on questions at wildearth.tv and uh, or use the hashtag safari live on twitter what is khaki fever a disease very specific normally to first time safari goes although i have heard of chronic cases that last for years A nice little LBJ for the birders. Hopefully, it doesn't disappear. Um, there. A little bit higher. Oh, there's jumping. Jump, jump. Jump into the open, please. So, uh, for our new time viewers, an LBJ is a, a birding term that refers to a little brown job. There's said little brown job. That is the most common little brown job we get here on in the Sabi Sands, it is called a rattling cysticula. So if anyone's new at keeping a bird list, there's a nice one for you, one of the more difficult ones to identify for new time, new viewers, but the most common of the cysticulas we get here, the rattling cysticula. Oh. <laughs>
Swiss tea. This guy mentioned keeping my voice calm. And Felicity's wondering how do you keep a calm posture when on safari with animals? Well, Felicity, any fast movements are bad. And you will notice sometimes when we're sitting with lions or whatnot and there might be other vehicles around a guest will suddenly move quickly and they will sort of react to that so any fast movements generally uh, any posture is fine as long as your movements are slow deliberate and of course as long as you're not screaming or the lions will be fine you can actually just talk normally with the cats it's not as important as with elephants uh, i find elephants react very differently to the different tones of voice you use when they get a little bit naughty, you can raise your voice and put a steel in your voice, so to speak, and that can help control the situation. And with most animals, and especially in the Sabi Sands, where they're so used to game drives and they're habituated, most of these animals have seen game drives since a couple of days or even the first day they were born. So uh, they're not so much, but with Ellie's, you always have to have that little bit of extra respect. I mean, they're such a huge animal. But using your voice and on foot using your body language can be very important. So even a massive elephant bull who starts getting a bit cheeky with you, you literally walk up to him wagging your finger with a stern voice and he'll turn tail and run. Uh, it's, it's, it, it all depends on the situation, the circumstance, when to use that, when to just keep quiet and stand still. And that obviously comes with years of experience of spending time with animals. Sharon is saying she, we know that the guides have to have some level of training, qualifications, certifications. She's more interested in the cameraman. Uh, do they need any wildlife qualifications or is it just a bonus if they do? Well, I think of all our cameramen, Andrew is the only one who has any wildlife uh, qualifications. Andrew actually worked for a guide before, he, as a guide before he became a cameraman. And Andrew's actually been lucky enough to guide in a place I'm quite jealous. He guided in Sri Lanka. What was the name of the reserve? Leopard Trails. Leopard Trails. And they had company. That's the company in the, in the National Park. The called Yala and Vupat. Yeah, Yala and Vupat National Park. Some of the highest densities of leopards in the world are there. And weird creatures like sloth bears. Andrew's also worked in South Africa, Hillensburg National Park, and in northern Zululand. So, Andrew has got some wildlife experience. You would never say that due to his general behavior, though. I'm only joking, Andrew. So, but most of the cameramen know. Um, they are cameramen first and foremost. But I would say our cameramen spending all the time they do with all the different presenters here would give quite a few guides a go for their money on wildlife behavior knowledge and just general knowledge. Chicago, I think Rich mm, might be a South African who might have spent a lot of time in, uh, in, in South Africa. Or, so Rich Levy says, Khaki fever is a shikankang on the mova. Now that is very, very, Rich is giving away all the guiding secrets. So if you're a safari guide in the lodge and you happen to have a pretty girl in the back of your vehicle, she's often referred to as a shikankang, a cheetah. Uh, so a code word that's used over the radio, uh, and Morva is obviously your car. So uh, there's Rich giving away a few of the, the, the safari guide secrets there. But uh, that is it, that, yes, that could be a form of khaki, reverse khaki fever. sweet. Uh, Judy says khaki fever is the flash of passion we have for all the Wild Earth presenters and cameramen. You are so sweet. Thank you very much, Judy. <laughs> Rich 
which TV says another definition of khaki fever is when all the new female guests are in estrus and present to the males in camp, if you know what I mean. Uh, yes, I do, Rich. So khaki fever is a, is a common guiding industry term. Uh, it happens when the guests fall dramatically uh, in love and have great adulation for their, their, their guide or ranger in his short khaki shorts, bulging leg muscles, large caliber firearms strung over the shoulder, striding off into the African bush after the big cats. Um, and it does also happen to the female guides where the adoring male guest is amazed by this gorgeous creature. Again, large caliber firearms strung over the shoulder, disappearing into the bush to pull a leopard out by the tail. <laughs> uh, Jamie, Jamie's just commented, obviously Jerry's been keeping up to date with what we've been chatting about. And Jamie says, well, when it comes to khaki fever, then sometimes the female guests are about as subtle as a leopardess in estrus in their advances. So what we're doing is we're just doing a quick little perusal past the block that Karula's den site is in. It's down in the drainage line. We're just checking to see if her tracks are coming out. We're not going to go into the den. And she was, she popped out at the Juma camp was two nights ago. I was actually sitting uh, at the one spot we get cell phone reception, chatting to my cousin who's just had a baby. And while I was sitting there, I suddenly heard the bush buck barking. And uh, I turned around there was Prula standing 30 meters away from me, watching me have my phone call. So she does come out. Obviously, she has to eat. She can't stay in this drainage system the whole time. So we're just doing a quick loop, see if there's any tracks coming out. Uh, there is a possibility she is going to move the den site before we check next week. And uh, we just like to have an idea of what's going on. We're not obviously going to put any pressure in the area. We're just doing a little drive by, seeing if we can see any tracks. Love Dogs, Sandra and Nicole and Brazzers is all asking about an update on the Karula uh, Cub situation. So while we're here, it's a perfect time to just run you through everything. So Andrew and I were the first to see the Cub uh, last week. We've zoned the area completely. We only stayed there for a very short time. There could be more than one Cub. We got out and we came out and now no one is allowed to drive into that area where the den site is. And that will be till Tuesday, which will be about, I think it's 10 days or so, or nine days since we since we found the, uh, the cub. And the reason for that is that cub is really, really young. I think that cub was less than 12 hours old. So we want to give it as much space as possible. Uh, even though we do occasionally just do a little meander past around the roads that surround the area, we don't drive in there. So on Tuesday, Taxon is back from leave, and we sat down with Taxon after finding the cub, and we, we came and, uh, with a plan forward. So on Tuesday, uh, between drives, so it will not be on the live safari, uh, we will go in there and check that in again. Now, there's a very important reason why we're not checking it on the live safari, because the live safari is on the early morning and the late afternoon. So that's when the most predator activity is with lions, hyenas, other leopards moving around. And they might get curious by the sound of the leopard, especially hyenas. So the reason that, that thing, the reason we'll probably go in at about one o'clock in the afternoon when it is at its hottest, and that is to minimize any other predator movement. So the likelihood of lion and hyena moving around in the heat of the day is very, very slim. Now all we doing is we'll be going in there having a very quick look to see if she's still utilizing that den or if uh, and if the cub's still there 
Um, if she is, great, wonderful, pull out, don't go there again for another 10 days. Zone it completely. If she hasn't, if she has moved, uh, that's just to let us know that she has moved. So we'll be on extra lookout for tracks after then, so we can find her next den site, uh, depending on where it is, and again, close that area off completely. So basically for the first month, it will be more of an ob observation process. Uh, we won't be viewing her as we would normally on a game drive while she's at the den. If she's out of the den here, walking along hunting, not a problem. We'll view her, but as soon as she moves back towards the den, we move. We leave, we don't go in. So after a month, we will reassess the situation again. And then maybe at a month, depending on the den site where it is, um, how her general demeanor is, because a leopard, leopard's demeanor changes you know, when they have cubs and sometimes when they're in estrus. And we'll meet again with Tax and, and obviously Yuri and Pippa, the owners of Jumo, are involved in all these con conversations. And uh, we will then reassess again. Then maybe if we feel it's right, but it's probably not going to be in a month, we will allow one vehicle a day to go to the den site. Uh, and if we do it, which I probably don't think we will, we'll just assess the situation in a month. And then again, we will keep checking up on the den side probably once a week. Uh, and then eventually after about two months, uh, once that left cub has developed enough to be able to scramble up trees and avoid hyenas and things like that, uh, then we will open that up to sort of one vehicle at a time, but multiple vehicles through the drive. And then eventually at six months, we'll probably open it up to two vehicles. And then only after a year, um, we'll open it up to three vehicles and viewing after dark for this one night. Uh, one must remember we can't get too excited, although it is so hard not to get so excited about a gorilla having cubs. The Sabi Sands has a leopard cub mortality rate of between 70 and 75%. So most cubs born never make it through to adulthood. So we must remember that, and there is a reason for that, because if leopards bred successfully every time, there'd be no impala left. Uh, so the predators having that very low, high mortality rate is actually to help keep themselves in check. And the biggest killer of leopard cubs in the Sabi Sands is actually other leopards, specifically male leopards, dispersal male leopards uh, that wander in from other areas. Uh, they are the greatest killer of leopard cubs. I hope that guys, I hope that helps you guys um, explain what we're going to do over the next uh, couple of weeks and months as regards to the new arrivals from the Queen, Queen, Queen Karula. I just saw the flicking tail of an Inyala through the bush. Just stopped to have a check. So James, uh, the cubs do have a scent from birth. Um, and obviously, uh, that is possibly one of the reasons they get found by male leopards and hyenas and things like that. So they will, the female will try and mitigate by moving them uh, quite frequently, normally once a week for the first month, sometimes not. Uh, you, you never really know. So that is one of the reasons the leopardess will move her den, is to try and stop that build-up of scent in a specific area that might attract other predators. So we're going to slowly make our way towards the tree house water hole. 
happening on that seat line. Um, haven't seen Nelson for a while. Have you, Andrew? Negative. Negative. So let's have a look for Nelson. Those of you wondering who Nelson is, Nelson is our one-eyed, one-horned, and one-ambitioned Impala, who are named after Lord Horatio Nelson, who had one eye, I think it was one eye, one arm, and one ambition. Al Nelson has one eye, one horn, and one ambition. Uh, Al Nelson and Lord Horatio Nelson's ambitions are a bit different. Lord Horatio was the end of Napoleon, and Al Nelson's to make it through the night. Slightly different ambitions, but nevertheless, uh, for those of you who have ever watched cricket, uh, I know quite a few of our North American viewers will scratch their head in bewilderment at the game of cricket, as we scratch our head in bewilderment at the game of baseball, actually, and basketball, and, 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 and what's that one? Uh, football. NASCAR. NASCAR. <laughs> we, we scratch our head in amazement. Oh, Ellie's been rearranging the road. But so, uh, in cricket, there's a superstitious number, and it is called the Nelson 111, 111. And if you're on 111 uh, as the batting side, it's said to be a dangerous position because you often lose wickets, and it's a very superstitious thing. And sportsmen seem to be incredibly superstitious creatures. Not washing socks for months on end, quite vile in my opinion. But anyway, whatever gets them to perform on the field. standard operating procedure and uh, from what happened the last time I wasn't there but I can only tell you what I know from those I've spoken to uh, they were following Kula they did not know um, where her den site was so it was a shock to all the vehicles when they arrived and there was a cub there secondly from what Taxon who was also in the site and tells me that the ghillie file were alarming at her I haven't actually seen the clip, but maybe I should go watch it so I can speak about it better. But the guinea fowl were alarming, and the alarming of the guinea fowl actually brought the hyena in. So hyenas will get attracted by impala alarm calls, guinea fowl alarm calls, anywhere where they think they might get a female. So according to Taxi, the hyena was actually brought in by guinea fowl alarm calls, uh, not by the vehicles being there. Just arrived at the treehouse waterhole. Whew, that was a close one. I thought that that roller was about to disappear off the branch before I could show it to you. And it really looks absolutely extraordinary in this morning light. Just look at those colors. Incredible. A lilac breasted roller, so one that we see regularly on our live safaris and sometimes we don't really, we almost get accustomed to their beauty. We don't really stop to observe them properly. And just count the colors, take a screenshot and count the colors and see how many you get to. Blues, the greens. And to actually really see that green on the top of the head is also incredible to look at. And we've looked at the feathers before and the way in which they're color changes depending on the light positioning and the way that the keratin is layered. And it's such a fascinating, yep, you clean that beak, <laughs> such a fascinating aspect of birds that take the two, the two roots, either the cryptically colored or this incredibly vibrant approach to coloration. And it's both the males and the females in the case of the rollers. And what's fortunate for us in terms of viewing them is they love these open perches where they can sit and observe with their incredible eyesight and watch for any crickets or moths or butterflies, anything that 
can become their next meal. And I've probably seen more roller kills than I have of any other bird. Surveying the landscape. And you can see how the wind has picked up this morning, gripping to stay on. And like all bird species, standing with its face into the wind so that the feathers aren't unduly ruffled. And look at that powerful hooked beak. Clearly a bird built for, not necessarily as powerfully built as a raptor, but clearly a bird that is designed for catching and hunting things, quite often in mid-air. The white highlight across the eyebrow, pink cheeks. And I remember our conversation about what music birds would listen to or different animals would listen to. And I believe that lilac-breasted rollers listened to Lady Gaga, according to some of our audience members. <laughs> you can see why. Definitely flamboyant in the extreme. It's just nice to stop and enjoy some of the scenery. And on the subject of birds, and forgive me because as we spoke about earlier with Trevor's question, I'm now absolutely boiling all of a sudden because I've been sitting still in the sun. But on the subject of birds and people building up their bird list, apparently, according to Kevin Catfish, there was an African green pigeon on, seen on the Juma Dam camera. And you were wondering if it's a common bird that we often see because you haven't heard the guides refer to it. And Kevin, I wouldn't call it very common. And the reason behind that is it's quite, it prefers the sort of riverine vegetation. So the vegetation around rivers or drainage lines, nice big jackalberry trees, they are arboreal. So they live mainly within trees and eat fruit in contrast to doves. It's one of the big differences between pigeons and doves. They are more based, the doves are more based on the ground. But Kevin, I've definitely put an African green pigeon on camera before, and I'm sure some of the other presenters have as well. It just doesn't happen every day. We don't see them all that often. The most I see them is around Arethusa. There's a particular part of the drainage line where I feel as though the entire Sabi Sands population of green pigeons sometimes inhabits. The problem is that they're actually quite, they're surprisingly skittish in that area. And you drive through the drainage line and you get to the jackalberry where they like to hang out and they take off in a massive flock and are gone. And it's one of those tricky things about live safaris, especially with birds, is they don't always make your job terribly easy, especially for the cameraman. And I know Brian has had some extraordinary shots where he's managed to track a flying bird in midair, which is no small task. And it comes with a great deal of experience in terms of predicting where that animal is going to go and managing to stay with them. And I'm not sure if you managed to catch me out just before Brent sent you across to me. I was muttering under my breath to that bird, trying to get it to stay where it was. So this morning, Brent showed you elephant tracks, and we've got them now as well. It's the same, I'm fairly certain it's the same elephant. And something I thought about at the time, how are we there, Brian? Can we manage? Okay, sorry, it's my fault, just taking my foot off the brake. There are those beautiful elephant tracks. You can see they're from, they're fairly fresh these from last night. And I'm going to hop out. I know that Brent's talked about them, but I want to show you something in terms of perspective. It's something that I've done before with these big male traps. In theory, I'm going to hop out. I appear to be trapped in the steering wheel. But just to show you, or we'll give you a rough perspective of size. Is this okay here, Brian? Perfect. So we've got the nice big round front foot here and the back foot here. So always most of the way carried around the front of the tracks. 
or elliptical, pointing us perfectly in the direction of where it's going. We lost the mic. No, no, just signaled a bit bad. Oh, okay, cool. All right. There we go. Rough perspective of size. In the track itself. Awesome. Really nice to see how, just how big these tracks really are. A footprint that I can fit into in terms of scale. Now I dropped something out. Ah, oh, there it is. Here we go. Got it. So our Ellie Bull walked through sometime last night or early this morning and wandered across. Here we go, just plug myself back in. Our live safaris come with an assortment of cables that sometimes take a bit of getting used to. been watching our live safaris or heard about the lilac, I assume lilac breasted rollers, Jen, but you were just saying that you were surprised. It is difficult. That's why I like to do things like hop out and go and stand in a track. It's actually really difficult to get a perspective of scale because Jen's saying that she thought that they were about the size of a sparrow and I assume, Jen, that you're talking about the lilac breasted roller and of course they're not. They're quite big solid birds about probably about yay high I'm trying to think of a good about roughly the size of one of the feral pigeons that you might get in your cities and your towns it's probably the best approximate uh, sample that i or example that i could provide you with but it is true we often forget and i like to be constantly reminded by viewers that you don't necessarily get a sense of how big or small or what size something is which is why we always try and provide a little bit of a a scale or a sample, which is why it's nice to hop out and show you just how big an elephant track actually is. And it's one of those things that becomes really clear with something like an elephant, for example, walking next to the car, but maybe with an Impala or a Nyala, it isn't quite as clear. And this bull has wandered down the road and left destruction in his wake. One, it looks like one of the nice big sort of 30, 25 to 30 year old males. It's been so pleasant over the last few weeks to really get to see some of the biggest males I've seen while I've been working here. Good morning. Oh, see what I mean? I know before you ask, I'm not going to attempt to move it. I'm going to look at it for a while, remember the indignities of the past. And it's the same species of tree as well. It's a silver cluster leaf, one that brought about my downfall the last time I tried to move it out of the road. And they're surprisingly fragile, as it turns out. Their branches aren't necessarily all that well attached. And yes, as I said, this bull has wandered down the road and placed a roadblock in his wake. See if we can squeeze past. Hello, tree. Sorry, tree. Not today. It's an interesting aspect of fascinated by the way that this elephant has planted things in his wake but just to go back to the brightly colored lilac breasted roller there's a fascinating question that sandblaster has asked so essentially most bird species the males are more brightly colored than the females that's a fairly common occurrence and I think this is where the lions walked from last night Sorry, Sandblaster, I'm going to answer your question. What I want to do though, since we've been talking about track size and perspective, I'm gonna try and see if I can find where a lion track intersects with an elephant one. 
although I don't think we're going to be so lucky. We've done a lot on lion tracking, but you can just get a rough sense of where they've walked. This is from the Inkuhumas yesterday. Here you go. Wandering up the road, those beautiful pug marks, as they are known. Shining clearly in the morning sun. And this is from last night. We know where they've gone. So it's just nice to show you the tracks of where they popped out. We were just about, probably about 100 meters in to that block, to my left. Right, so Sandblaster's question, back to birds and away from lion tracks, was the males are generally more brightly colored. Is, are they therefore more at risk of predation? because they attract more attention. And to an extent, yes, I think that is the case. It's always an interesting one because it's that curious combination. What you got there? Oh, an elephant. Hello, elephant. Surprisingly hidden. I wasn't expecting to see an elephant. I thought they'd all wandered off. Let's go visit him. See if we can get a nice view. Well done, thank you, Brian. Amazing how you can miss a six-ton pachyderm if you're busy chattering away about birds. But yes, Sandblaster, just to finish off, it is one of those interesting adaptions that some birds have gone for bright coloration, some have gone for cryptic, and in different approaches. I would say which is far more likely to cause the death of males over females is, first of all, their distraction levels in breeding season, which I think plays a huge role when they're attempting to court the females, they lose focus a little bit on the world around them, in the same way that male impala do. And then also the fact that some of them have these long tails that often slow them down in flight. So for example, a paradise flycatcher or a paradise wider. Sorry guys, we're doing a bit of a bumpy bumpy along here. But I think this was the only way we were going to get a view of this gentleman. Hello boy. Mm. This is this is Brent's bull. It's Brent's bull from yesterday. He's not terribly comfortable around cars. We think he's come in from that big open section around Kruger. Hello, boy. It's okay. Yeah, definitely not a regular Sabi Sands elephant. We think he's come from that big, there's a section of Kruger to the east of our boundary where there are absolutely no roads, no vehicles, and the animals that are around those areas get quite accustomed to being solitary and not as used, used to the vehicle noise as we are. So he's moved off almost completely. Obviously, I'm not going to push or follow him, and I'm probably going to just leave him be and let him wander into the drainage line. We won't get anywhere. All we'll serve to do is frighten him. Now, I know that Brent was chatting earlier about habituating animals. And you'll find the more he associates with our elephants and all the elephants that we see regularly, and the more that he spends time around this area and gets safari vehicles coming around him, the more comfortable he'll get. And it's just a question of allowing him plenty of personal space. And you'll probably find that he becomes habituated very quickly if he decides to stick around but I'm definitely not going to follow him any further. He's still there, just by the way. We haven't scared him away, he isn't running or anything like that. He's just moved slightly out of our view into the drainage line. So he's not terrified, he's just a little bit uncomfortable. subject of elephants and the breeding herds which we could well get to see anytime you never know when they might wander through rich levy is watching with his three-year-old niece jada and was wondering do we get baby elephants yes we get baby elephants and if you watch if you keep watching i'm sure we'll be able to show you a baby elephant now the wonderful thing is that an elephant that I've always had a soft spot for, the, the female with the trunk that is, the end has been removed, probably by a snare, she's got a brand new little baby girl. And there's not much that's cuter than a playful baby elephant.
So yes, we could well be showing you baby elephants. Unfortunately, we can't really show you our friend, our skittish elephant bull. He's just disappeared into the drainage line. It'll be interesting to see. It will actually be really interesting to monitor his progress if he decides to stick around. And we are getting a lot of these elephants moving in because of the drought. The fact that there's still water in this particular part of the Sabi sands, not that much, but there's more water, for example, than there is on the western edge of Kruger. So we are seeing these elephants come in more and more. It's one of the reasons why we've seen some of those really large bulls for the first time that have come in and why we're getting little bulls that are clearly not as used to the presence of people as, for example, our breeding herds generally are. Hey, little boy, where did you go? No, he's disappeared. <laughs> so earlier we drove around the elephant's roadblock, the silver cluster leaf, and I said that I wasn't even going to attempt to move it after my loss of dignity the last time I tried that. Um, and for those of you who missed it, I'm, I fell over. Let's, let's just leave it at that. But Christopher wants to know who does remove the trees that have fallen over into the road. And it is actually important that they are removed because what happens is if people regularly skirt around them, they will end up creating a new road and that's not what you want because roads actually are a necessary part of the safari experience, but they do do a certain amount of damage to the ecosystem in itself because they act as a drain for the water. So it's important that trees are removed so that you don't start creating new roads where you don't really need to. We always report them. As soon as we see them, we report them to the lodge manager and the staff that work here, and they'll come out if it's a big tree with a train chainsaw. I'm going to speak softly. I'm hoping they're going to stay, but I don't think they are. Not often that you get Impala as relaxed this close to you. Hey, making funny noises, Impalas. They are so beautiful. So sorry, Christopher, yes, we'll get one of the um, people who work on the ground as maintenance staff to remove it, or we will, if we can, remove it ourselves. It is not always necessarily, though, a process that needs to be enacted live, especially if you're going to perform a Jamie and fall over. I very quickly learned my lesson. Look at this beautiful girl. And already enjoying the refuge of the shade on this morning. We're coming up to close to eight o'clock and it is bakingly hot. The sun is blazing down upon us. Hello, girl. Well, they might be the most common antelope species. We might see them all the time, but it's still nice, especially with this power of this camera to zoom in on them. It's still actually really pleasant to observe them. Yes, show us your teeth, girl. I want to show everybody the loose bottom teeth that Impala have. It's one of their grooming adaptations. Also, look at the fine whiskers all around their chin and their nose. <laughs> all part of having a look at or sensing where the best leaves are going to be in combination with the eyes and the ears. And that fascinating shape of their head. Hello, beautiful. She's ruminating ever so slightly. I'm glad that she is as comfortable as she seems to be with us. Very often when you stop to look at antelope, they're quite comfortable with you driving past, but as soon as you stop to look, they get a bit nervous. She's currently ruminating. So re-chewing the balls of cud that she's eaten earlier. I know that Brent did touch upon the only Impala character that we happen to know by sight, 
and that was Nelson the Impala. And yes, I have adopted Brent's name. I think it is a good name, unfortunately. Um, so Brent named the one-eyed, one-horned Impala Nelson. I haven't seen him, as Brent mentioned. I don't think any of us have seen him for quite a while. Doesn't mean he's not here. It just means that we haven't seen him. He could well be hiding in the vegetation. But it's surprising how now every single Impala herd, I have to stop and look to see if I can find Nelson, which is a bizarre experience. I've never stopped to look at individual Impala before. <laughs> you can see when you're looking at that group of youngsters why. They're not really identifiable, but Nelson is a special case. Beautiful sight, all already clustered together in the shade and the youngsters wandering around. And we should be seeing, I know that Scott's seen one, I still haven't, but we should be in for a couple of late impala births, so new babies coming through. So for new viewers who might have missed the first impala lambing season, you'll be in for a treat because you'll get to see a couple of newborn wobbly skinny little baby impalas wandering about soon. I'm sure we're going to be able to get some on camera for you shortly. Nice mixed breeding herd, all ages, all sizes, males and females. And very soon that will change and we'll come to the rutting season. The males will separate from the females and spend a considerable period of time, as we discussed, similar to the bird situation when they are distracted by displaying. They'll spend most of their time chasing males away and herding the females. It all becomes very interesting to observe and the impala suddenly become one of the most vocal animals that we get out here. And speaking of the most vocal animals that we get out here, let's pop over to Brent and see what he's up to. So, I hope you had a fantastic view of that roller with Jamie. Uh, just, I realized something as I was waffling on after I'd finished waffling, um, that I mentioned tax. And forget that you guys aren't regulars in the Safari Live family. So Taxon is the guide from Juma. He's a great guy. He's been in this area for many, many years. That's why we meet with Taxon when we're discussing what to do with leopards, etc. So just in case a few of you are wondering who's Tax or Taxi or Taxon and all the different manners we refer to him. So Andrew and I have decided to take on a serious challenge now. And we are looking for butterflies. One just scooted away. Now this is a great time of the morning to look for butterflies. So the dew. And oh, we nearly landed on a very interesting little plant. That is an African monarch. So a cousin to the monarch that we get in, that you guys get in North America. And it's a butterland. Or is it teasing Andrew? It's teasing Andrew. It's teasing you, Andrew. It's teasing Andrew. And look at that. It's landed on a really interesting little flower. Oh, beautiful. Lovely work, Andrew. Look, we're about to reach up and extend its proboscis into that Waltharia to get the sweet nectar. So African monarchs in this area use as the larval stage, so their caterpillar stage, use two different types of plants, mostly as a host. And the one it's drinking out of now is also is one of those plants. It doesn't even have a common name. It only has a scientific name, which is Waltharia indica. And it is a noxious plant species. So when those caterpillars are munching on the leaves of the Waltharia or the milkweed, which is another one that the monarch uses as a host plant, the, the caterpillar or larval stage sequest of quite a vicious poison. It's called a hydrogen cyanide from this plant. And 
because they eat this plant in their larval phase, that hydrogen cyanide translates to their adult phase, meaning the adults are noxious. And that's why, as Andrew was tracking that African monarch, you see it doesn't fly very fast, not like an African vagrant. He's trying to avoid being eaten. It's got those bright, beautiful colors that it flaps around. And that is to warn all birds that it is not nice to eat and will taste very vile and possibly make them a bit sick. And there we go, wonderful sighting. Probably one of the best sightings we've had of an African monarch. Well done, Andrew, good tracking. I thought that butterfly was going to lose you for a second or two. Oh, is it too close? Oh, it's hiding there. Onto another wildfire. Yeah? Well, beautiful camera work, Andrew. Okay. Well, isn't that fascinating? I'm not. I was actually going to go pick that particular. Um, but I'm not going to because that butterfly is still enjoying its Waltharia, but I will find another one. And we don't have to go far. Just finding one that's got a nice flower on it to show you carefully. Well, let's keep going. And I was saying this is a great time of the morning to see butterflies because the initial dew from the early morning uh, has worn off, so the butterflies have dried out, so they're now starting to get mobile, out feeding. And we will find you a Waltharia shortly. There we go. There we go. Here's the Waltharia flower. Tiny little yellow flowers, very petite. Now, hopefully that's a new flower list for a few of you, in case you missed the name, Waltharia indica. And Patricia, welcome Patricia, is wondering, does the African monarch migrate like the North American monarch? It doesn't, Patricia. Uh, it, it seems to be far more, it's, or it doesn't migrate in those distances. There will be local sort of uh, seasonal migrations between different areas, but it doesn't migrate over vast distances like the North American monarch. And isn't that amazing that that North American monarch migrates over generations? I, th I find that incredibly fascinating, that they will migrate to a certain spot over here, uh, pupate, breed, produce larval, hatch, that'll emerge from that larval stage and then move on again. Here we go. One of my, definitely one of my favorite and pretty, the prettiest birds around that we see quite regularly, the white helmet shrike. Very pretty little birds. move around in flocks, feeding off insects. We've even seen them collecting baby spiders out of webs on the safaris before. Helping to keep the insect population in check. Come down a bit. Oh, look at that, talking. Another one just flew in, having a conversation. Wouldn't it be amazing to know what they were saying? I think it's love. Look at that. I think that looks like love. What do you think, Andrew? Love is in the air. Almost expected Andrew to break out in song there. Oh, they're disappearing in there. But you can hear that lovely little... Definitely looks like a bit of a courting ritual going on. Could that not be a youngster asking for food? Mm, I don't think so. They look, both look like adults. Yeah, Andrew just asked, in case you missed, is it not a youngster begging for food? And I don't think so. I think that looks very much like a courting ritual. Oh. 
speaking of birds, and they disappear, brother on Twitter is wondering, have the migratory birds left yet? They have not. They're still with us for a while. Uh, hopefully for longer if we get a little bit of late rain. But we, they should still be with us for a couple of months at least. Let's see if we can spot you a migratory bird now. This is a good area for them, or specifically the European rollers. They like to sit on some of these dead stumps here. Oh, Andrew, sorry, I couldn't figure out what was going on. Andrew spotted a bat in there. And the white bat bolted it on. There we go. You can see that very distinct flight pattern of a bat there. It almost looks like it's trying to balance. See how its wings tip from side to side? And that's where it gets its name from. Batelier is the French word for acrobat or tightrope walker. So it looks like trying to balance on a tightrope. And it is like that because they have a very short tail. They've lost a bit of stability, but they've gained a bit of mobility in that. They don't fly as high as the other birds, and they're often the first to spot a carcass before the vultures and others, them and tawny eagles. There we go. Thank you, Andrew. Good spot. Sorry, I missed it. question from X Ranger. How's my live bird list going? I think it's at about 70 now. I haven't checked. I'll have to update after after drive on the birds that I've seen today that I haven't added to the list. I think it's about 70 or 80. So I'm catching up with you guys. Uh, I think before the end of February should be on about 200, I reckon. What do you think, Andrew? Pushing it. Pushing it. Well, that's possible. Just going to have to up the birding game. So guys, from, for the rest of the month, to do the bird list, no more looking for big cats for me. I'm out. I'll leave it to the other guys. I'm just going to do birds from now on. I don't believe you. <laughs> uh, Andrew's probably right. I can't help myself if I see a fresh set of lion or leopard tracks. They have to be followed. Not a European roller in sight. popped us an email and thank you very much Harry. and a lot of you who have been watching for a long time know I love my collective nouns and Cherry has taught me something new today so a huge thank you and, and it is the collective noun for butterflies a, a kaleidoscope isn't that just wonderful a kaleidoscope of butterflies that's definitely one that I'm going to remember Cherry with your permission I'd like to use that on drive from time to time Terry, sorry, not Sherry. Sorry, sorry, Terry. So, a very good safari live welcome to Barb from Salt Lake City who went on her first African safari in June last year to Tanzania. Uh, well, Bob, let me know where you went in Tanzania. I, I lived up there for a while. Uh, Bob is wondering where I would recommend going next. Well, you started with a great spot, Bob, in Tanzania. It is a spectacular country. Now, next, I think for me, personally, yeah, I heard an orange vest and push like there it is back. Sorry guys, I just need to be on the game drive radio for a second. Um, here's my game drive radio gone. Ah, oh, well, they're running that sighting on the Eastern Channel. Is that the orange-breasted bushlike, Andrew? No. I don't think so. 
couldn't find him. Okay, he's still there. Not moving, too he's much. not moving, isn't he? What is that bird you found up top there, Andrew? I thought it was a wider for I think you might be right. That could be a really good bird for a lot of people. Let's, let's get a bit wider. Let's see if we can see the wider. It is the paradise wider. Awesome. I have, it's the first one of this wet season that I've seen. Well spotted, Andrew. There you go. A paradise wider. Look at that spectacular tail. That is there to impress the ladies. So interesting enough, that is the breeding plumage. During the winter months, it will be a drab, browny little bird. Oh, he's off. Oh, man. Well, I think that's definitely a really good bird for a lot of you. A new one to add to your list, uh, the Paradise Wider. And I saw, I think, maybe only one or two last wet season. But anyway, that's a great bird. Well spotted, Andrew. Thank you. It's a pity you couldn't get the orange breasted <laughs> bushrike as well. But there we go. A great bird for your bird lists. So back to Bob. I was wondering where you should, should go on safari next. Well, Bob. I think it definitely has to be, it's one of three options really, it depends on what you, re uh, what you want, but I would say uh, South Africa is always a great one, uh, Botswana and Zambia, all those three all high up in my destinations in Africa, uh, depending on what time of the year you'd like to go. Um, if you want to see leopards, and lots of leopards, uh, there's much better than the Sabi Sands here in South Africa. And also the South Luangwa in Zambia is also fantastic for leopards. And oh, but the Botswana speaks for itself, the Akavanga. It's so difficult. I'd say, Bob, if you can, over the next few years, go to war. I know that is easier said than done. I'm heading up into the western corner here, hoping for some elephants, but no sign of them just yet. You see what I've spotted, Andrew? The clouds. Up in the sky, above the clouds. 